Welcome, everyone, to our NCAA Social Series. This is episode 54. I'm Andy Katz. Pleased to be joined by Mid-American Commissioner John Steinbrecher and Alexis Garrett, a track athlete from Troy University in her final season of eligibility. The topic on our show, transfers. It certainly has been a hot topic. The transfer portal uh, is at uh, record numbers for a number of reasons. Uh, obviously dealing with uh, COVID and the sort of the extra free year that everyone is receiving, but we've got news on transfers. And then we want to explain a couple of things because something's got a little lost in translation with the news. So first in general, Alexis, I just want to get your perspective as a student athlete uh, and your representation um, on this committee, this working group, how much was this needed to have, this one-time exemption for student athletes to be able to transfer. Yeah, thank you, Andy. Um, before I start, I just want to pay homage to um, the other student athlete leaders who came before me, who kind of got us to this point. Um, Noah Knight, Nick Clark, and Morgan Chaw, um, all three of them, you know, really just emphasized having equality within the association for student athletes and just making sure everybody has that one-time transfer you know opportunity you know if they're academic academically eligible of course um to transfer without penalty and i think that everybody deserves that chance and so all in all like it really just <clears throat> sets that foundation of equal playing field um turns to 32 percent that were treated differently from the other 68 everybody is now the 100 percent and it's already hard enough to make decisions that impact you or your family emotionally and mentally. And so I think that um, the one-time transfer just kind of mitigates those concerns. Um, in addition to the concerns you have to think about, you know, financially and academically at your institution. So it's really important. Um, it's gonna always be an important topic. And I just look forward to seeing what happens in the future, you know, once this thing gets rolling, so. So John, that's a great way to start, which is, uh, I know you've got a, a very busy day job as the commissioner of the MAC, uh, but this has taken up a lot of your time and it's great to have input from student athletes. So first, before I wanna to get to the nuts and bolts, I just wanna sort of just an overall umbrella comment from you about how hard it was to get to this point to allow this to happen. They say that change often comes slowly, right? Especially in large associations such as this. This has quite literally been a six year journey. Uh, I could go back to 2015 when I made some comments and some other people did and talking about the fact we need to come up with some rationale behind why do we have a transfer policy that treats five sports differently than everybody else. We either need to ha have a rationale for why that is, or we need to move to a unified standard, whatever that standard may be. Should everybody have access to a one time transfer opportunity? Should no one have access? And so that started the conversation. And six years later, you see where we've ended up. All right, so let's educate everyone. Those five sports were which ones? Football, men's and women's basketball, baseball, and men's ice hockey. And most of our transfer rules that we've been dealing with really date back to the 1960s and even before then. And I think everyone would acknowledge today's student athlete experience, the college experience is vastly different than it was 50 years ago. And let's use this as a starting point. A, a preponderance of our student athletes at the division one level are coming in basically going to school year round. And particularly in those five sports we talked about. And so in many cases, if they, want to do so, they can find themselves graduating in three, three and a half years. They're picking up lots of credit hours along the way. And so they're uh, much more able to absorb what a transfer does when you go. When you leave from one school to another, inevitably you're gonna lose credit hours in the process. And so you get behind kind of that four-year clock we think of. Well, because of what we're doing or what the student athletes are doing, they're able to mitigate those losses, pick up the credit hours much more quick, quick, quickly, excuse me, or maybe have some in reserve and are able to continue to transfer and be academically successful, which at the end of the day is the end game and most important piece of this puzzle. 
it was an honor and a privilege for me to get on those calls with, you know, different people who serve in different capacities um, throughout the association, just hear their, um, their, their views on it. And then I get to put, you know, say how I feel about it from a student athlete perspective. And really we all agreed on the same thing. We want better for the overall student athlete experience. And so we don't want different things. We want the same thing. It just comes from different, you know, things going on from different directions, but ultimately it was a collaborative process because we all want the same thing in the end. All right, John, so let's deal with the news. Um, define for me who now can have a one-time exemption. Yeah. It's a unified rule that is applicable across all NCAA Division I sports. Uh, and there's um, an array of things that you kind of have to check the boxes off to qualify for it. Must be the first time that student athlete transfers from one four-year institution to another four-year institution. So it's their first time transferring, right? Uh, they have to be academically eligible at the institution at which they are currently at. They have to meet progress towards degree requirements at the institution that they are going to. And that's a real important consideration for the student athletes and the institutions that might want to recruit that student athlete as a transfer student athlete. Uh, they're gonna have to enter the transfer portal uh, by a prescribed notification of transfer date. And we can get into that later, but before they can enter that transfer portal and all the portal is, is a public declaration that I intend to transfer. It's about transparency to who is that young man or woman who's interested in going somewhere else now and is willing to be re-recruited. Um, before they go into that portal, the student athletes are gonna have to complete an educational module. And within that module, they'll get into the details of this, of what are the obligations of the student athlete? What are the obligations of the institution? Because this has some ramifications potentially on their financial aid. Uh, are they gonna, they need to be thinking about if I transfer to institution X, am I gonna be able to meet progress towards degree requirements in at that school? And if not, do I have to be in some other major? And what does that mean to me? Does that really interest me? So all of those things get brought to light and uh, makes the student athlete, it's kind of a check in the system to take a deep breath. Is this really what I want to do? Um, and then once they're in the portal, made that public declaration, the student athlete is going to have to certify uh, that they have not uh, been in contact with any schools or coaches at another institution prior to entering that portal. And the institution, if they ultimately transfer to uh, the head coach, at that program is gonna to have to certify that they have not had inappropriate contact with that student athlete prior to the student athlete entering the portal. All right, so what are the deadlines for this year, which I know is unique and unprecedented versus what it will be going forward? This year, uh, the notification of transfer date is July 1. Beginning with the 21-22 academic year for fall and winter sports, that date will be May 1st, for spring sports, uh, it will be July 1. Alexis, what do you think of those dates, the adjustment of this year? Because A, this is just happening, and B, we're still not out of the pandemic. Yeah, I think that um, the, the committee did a great job considering all the circumstances, um, the you know things that are going on and giving student athletes more time to just think through um, the decisions. And next year, just starting fresh and give everybody, you know, giving everyone that that equal time to um, do what they need to do. So I was in agreement with it. Uh, I remember that conversation on that call it was very, very, you know, it was long. We were on that call for a long time because we were trying to make sure that we did what was best, you know, for my peers and for the student athletes. And so um, I, I, I'm led by great people and, you know, I think it was a great decision, so. All right, so now we've done sort of the easy things. Now, uh, some curveballs. number one, what happens if student X has already transferred? Uh, because there's a lot of this out there, especially now. So now he's or she is on to school three. What happens to that student athlete, John? Well, by rule, they would not be eligible for a one-time transfer exception. Could they uh, put in a waiver and say, we have some uh, extraordinary circumstances 
that dictate that I believe it is in my best interest to move to another school, they could pursue that. There is certainly no, um, uh, they very well may not get that waiver. So I, I wanna throw this out there and, and I sort of threw this out uh, on social media and I didn't mean it as a, this was my opinion that, yeah. you know, coaching changes a lot of times allow the waiver to be processed. I know it is not a rule, but how, and in what way, I guess, were coaching changes discussed? <laughs> uh, part and parcel of all this, right? Uh, the vast majority of student athletes that are transferring are transferring for athletic reasons, not academic reasons, right? And obviously, uh, the head coach, and I suppose you could even argue assistant coaches, are an awful big part of that. So there was consideration into that. So, for instance, uh, for the fall and winter sports, if they're student athlete has not made a decision to transfer. We get past that notification of transfer date of, of May 1st. If there's a coaching change after that, they can access a waiver because of that. So I think we're cognizant of that, but let's say you've already transferred once. That does not necessarily mean that that's going to be a mitigating factor, It'd be a totality of circumstances. And I wouldn't begin to, to even uh, want to think where the, the a waiver committee would go. Uh, Alexis, where do you stand and your peers on coaching changes and whether or not that should be a, a factor potentially for a waiver? I think it's a case by case basis. And I think as long as you're doing what's best for you and what's best for your family, you know, whatever happens after that, whatever decisions you need to make, I think that's the decision you need to go with. All right, grad transfers, John, we're seeing a lot of those now. Um, grad transfers were allowed to play right away, but now because of, and this is unprecedented, because of the sort of free year due to COVID, we now have double grad transfers, you know, because they, they transferred as a graduate student and now they can sort of play again but maybe they want another opportunity at school three. Um, what happens to them? You know, that's a good question. Again, part of the, the grad transfer requirement stated that that was supposed to be their first time transfer, right? So now you're talking about a second or whatever opportunity. Again, there's waiver, you can submit a waiver. Again, can you spell out the circumstances that these extraordinary circumstances that, uh, why I need to go to Institution X now? What, what's, what's the degree program you're going to be pursuing there? Is this just an athletic issue? You know, the, the grad transfer is a real interesting um, phenomenon. Uh, and, and I think we look at it as a student athlete who has concluded their undergraduate degree. They've done exactly what we want them to do, right? And so, okay, now they've gone on and moved on to somewhere else starting a grad degree. Well, uh, from the school's perspective, it can be challenging because those are limited enrollment slots, right? And so if those student athletes don't stay and complete their degree, it's, it's sometimes damaging to those academic programs. So I think people need to think long and hard about that, particularly in the grad transfer space and particularly about multiple grad transfers. Again, I won't begin to predict where that goes. So the bottom line is the grad transfer on his second grad transfer would have to at least appeal for a waiver to try to play right away without sitting out. Correct. Uh, Alexis, where were your peers on the grad transfer issue? Same thing, it's just, you know, it, even though you, you know, you've done what you came to do, you came to play, you came to get a degree, you did that. So whatever happens after that, if you feel like you need to do that, you know, there may be consequences that come with it, but do what's best for you. That's that's just my whole thing. Um, the student athlete experience is really doing what's best for you and, you know, doing the sport that you love. So. So here's something I think both of you can speak to, which is um, you run track in the Sun Belt, and John, you're the commissioner of the Mid-American Conference. So uh, neither one participating in a, quote, power five league. And your student athletes or your peers, Alexis, you know, could get poached. And yet you are doing something that benefits everyone, even though it technically could work against your league and, you know, your competitors. And I'm just curious just how that factored in, John, as you're working through this, knowing that there could be athletes in your league that are going to, to try to move up and take advantage of this. 
and, and drain a little bit of um, uh, of the league? Well, a, a couple things I would point to. And let's start with the fact that, yeah, we've just now passed a unified transfer rule. But for the past four or five plus years, there's been a waiver process that is basically, um, if you got into it, more often than not, you were moving through. We've been in this environment for X number of years now. I don't view this as a massive change. Secondly, people, the vast majority of transfers are lateral or down. Third, you know what? Student athletes do transfer up. They do transfer down. We have student athletes transfer out of our league. We have student athletes transfer into our league. It works both ways. We had a student athlete, a basketball player in our league a year ago, was uh, I believe our player of the year, uh, went into the portal. Uh, the institution played it marvelously. They let the young man go out there, look around. He was recruited by all the heavyweights you'd like to think of. At the end of that, he said, you know what? The best place for me is to stay right where I'm at. This at the end of the day is about student athlete opportunity and choice. Um, yeah, I, 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 I can't always take my competitive hat off, but a little bit in this, you have to. Um, this is, we're in an environment where either we're gonna manage our rules and provide uh, a sufficient degree of opportunity and choice while at the same time providing some level of certainty for institutions in terms of managing their roster, for the student athletes who are left behind, for them to know who's on our team, right? And, and all of that certainty. So we've got to manage all of these things. What we came up with is um, probably the best answer we can come up with, because if we don't take care of it ourselves, someone else is going to take care of it for us. Alexis, what are your thoughts on this, that, that um, you know, this wasn't driven uh, from Indianapolis. This was the membership. I mean, you know, you're, you know, you and your peers, student athletes, here you got the commissioner of the Mid-American Conference, that everyone was listening to everyone else, which I think is critical here, which doesn't always happen and hasn't always happened, but it really did here. Uh, and these student athletes are having a voice and they're being empowered. What were your thoughts of, of being sort of you know, in the room, if you will, whether it was virtual or in person, and seeing sort of how the sausage is made and producing this. Yeah, um, like I said before, it was a collaborative process, and it was it. You know, the D1 SAC was very vocal about how they felt about um, this one-time transfer legislation. It, you know, we were able to express how we felt on multiple occasions. And as far as you know, me being a Sun Belt representative and you know, it may come back to bite one of my, you know, Sunbelt peers um, years down the line. In track specifically, if you can run fast, you can jump far, it doesn't really matter where you go. You know, you go where, you know, where you're wanted, where you value and where you want to participate because that's best for you. And so I think that if we, you know, keep that in mind, like John said, the student athlete experience, it doesn't really matter, um, you know, where you're going or, you know, if you're transferring up or down, just as long as you're doing what's best for you. And so, yeah, I definitely agree. Um, being a part of this process, like I said, I always remember it, you know, being able to take this thing on home um, after coming behind great leaders who worked hard to, you know, get where we are. And so it is really been uh, a, a really good a process, you know, monthly meetings, bi-weekly, sometimes twice a week, like whatever it took, because that's what I do. I'm an advocate for student athletes and I speak for those who may not have a chance to be in those rooms. And I want them to know that I did what, what I thought was best for us. So John, I just want to put a bow on this that uh, to calm people down that, uh, and, and this is my opinion, but I just want to see if you agree with me on this and, and, and share yours, obviously, that the number that are in the pro portal this year, certainly in the sport of basketball, um, is much more of a factor of this sort of perfect storm of the free year, the grad transfer, uh, this now one-time exemption, um, you know, that, and this year was like, unlike any other. I mean, I, I just don't expect the number to be as crazy it is, as it is now. And probably to your point earlier, I think we're going to see more and more come back. And I've already seen some of that uh, once they sort of, you know, assess the landscape out there. What, what's your assessment of the number this spring versus what it might be as we go forward and people are familiar with this? Andy, I think that's a, a, a reasonable guesstimate of, of what's occurring right now. I guess time will tell. 
Uh, you probably have a number of student athletes who are perhaps taking a flyer. You know, maybe they're way down on the depth chart. Maybe they're a walk on and, and a, a, a large number of other things. This is a new and exciting thing for some student athletes. So I would guesstimate that the next year or two is going to be a little choppy. It's going to be a little unsettled. It's a new rule and the student athletes are going to need to figure it out. The coaches and institutions are going to need to figure it out. Um, the grass is not always greener, right, for either side of the equation. Um, and the student athletes, I think, will become pretty savvy in this process, thinking about what are my educational priorities? What are my athletic priorities? How do I achieve all of those things? The coaches are going to figure this out. I really don't think you build a program through the transfer portal. I think you still build the program from the grassroots up, right? Maybe you fill in some spots. And, and again, I'm guesstimating. I don't spend my livelihood recruiting student athletes. We'll find out. The, the savvy coaches are the ones who always adapt and change and, and make these things work. All right. So let's just put a summary here. Uh, deadline for this year is July 1. In 22, it'll be May 1, correct? May 1 for fall and winter sports, July 1 for spring sports. In 2022. Correct. Or excuse me. Yeah, in 21-22. This year, it's July 1. Yes. The following year, it's May 1 and July 1. Correct. All right. One-time exemption, all sports, all equal across the board. If you are a double transfer of an undergrad or a double grad transfer, you have to go through the waiver process. That, that would be accurate. You'd have to pursue a waiver to be able to, you can always transfer, right? You can yeah. always transfer and get financial aid. It's to be transfer and be immediately eligible. To all compete. right. So we want to clear all that up. There should be no confusion going forward for everyone watching this. These are the guardrails. These are the rules going forward. All right. Appreciate all your time. I think this is very informational, educational. Alexis Garrett, uh, Finish up strong at Troy. Appreciate it. Uh, John Steinbrecher, you've got uh, your day job at the Mac now. I, I know you weren't not focused on it, but now you can lock in even more uh, into the uh, spring sports and prepping for what we hope will be a normal fall. And that'll conclude episode 54 here on our NCAA social series. As always, you can go to ncaa.org slash social series. We've got them all archived over the past year. We'll talk again next week. Stay safe. Stay safe, everyone.